Welcome to Classical Chats. I'm Tiffany. I'm a classical pianist, also the host of this video series where I talk to all kinds of people who love classical music. I'm also the founder of Together with Classical. Today we have JP Waxman, who is a composer in the UK, and I'm excited to learn about his process as a media composer in particular. I think it's always very fascinating for me to learn from composers because I'm always on the other side of music having the music already written and just kind of recreating the music in a way. So I look forward to this. Welcome, JP. So Thank you me. are from a very unique background, and I think that's very interesting that you are a media composer, but you are also um, connected to classical music still, but you also do other things like be an assistant to amazing orchestras. So can you just start from the very beginning? How did you start with music? So my parents always, always played music, um, obviously in, in the house and, and that's kind of where it all started really. Um, and yeah, they always played um, classical music and they, but also um, bands and artists like Paul Simon as well. That was like uh, the soundtrack of, of growing up. So I grew up in the US actually in America um, as where I was born. Um, and yeah, and then uh, I moved here when I was, I was quite young and we moved to uh, like just outside London, yeah, in the countryside. Uh, so London, like the city centre, was about half half hour train ride away. Um, and yeah, and we just uh, we would always uh, go into London and see an anything and everything. Um, and that that's what really kind of piqued my interest in it. I uh, I played guitar from a, a very young age, um, and then and I always thought I wanted to be in a band uh, and play uh, like. Uh, play jazz and um, and rock and, and all that sort of stuff. And then, uh, but then I, I started playing violin and piano as well. And kind of ever since then, I, guitar steadily got more and more sidelined. What drawn you to violin and piano going from guitar? Um, I had an uh, introduction to sort of to piano from um, from just listening to classical music and and, and loving it. Uh, and then, and one day I just thought I'd kind of try, try it a bit and just, see what happened uh and then it kind of piano especially kind of like grabbed me um and i've just loved it ever since and um and i just wanted to develop that further um for kind of as long as possible alongside violin and so yeah so i i, I kept playing those for um years and years and years now um i steadily started getting drawn to the nuts and bolts of of classical music and, and how it's put together and the compositional aspects of it and um and of course like the emotional aspects of it and so yeah i i started uh exploring that and slowly writing my own um pretty terrible little uh little pieces but just having fun and experimenting with it and uh and and yeah kind of from there it just took off with my interest in composition and it steadily became the overarching kind of love of music was composition and um and yeah, I still play, of course, uh, and, and I love it. But um, yeah, composition is very much where now it's very cathartic for me, uh, uh, writing music. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of how I, I got into music. It was very much a sort of gradual love of it, just listening and then slowly kind of playing instruments and steadily it kind of it just grew and grew. Yeah, it's very organic, but it makes you also yeah. very multi-talented because you have so many different experiences with the instruments. Um, yeah, I feel very lucky to have the, all those um, different sort of uh, instrumental skills, um, which I can apply to composition, especially yeah. being able to play a string instrument uh, is, is really fortunate. And obviously, you can play any instrument part on the piano, um, yeah, because all the keys are there. So uh, composition to me is a wonderful outlet. Um, and like you say, the having that expertise in sort of the, the different instruments also helps with media composition, of course because um, often when you're writing for clients and film, there's a, a huge variety of, of things that you have to do for them. Um, you know, you have to write in a massive variety of styles um, and, and a huge variety of ensembles. You'll have to kind of, they ask you for a sort of a jazz underscore or something. And then the next day you actually, they want sort of end credit sequence that will fl all flowy and orchestral and stuff like that. So um, yeah, yeah it, it's, yeah, it's very varied. How did you get into media composition in particular? Do you know the, the film Spirited Away? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's that, uh, the animation film. I, uh, it's one of my favorite films of, of, of all time and it has an absolutely stunning 
um, orchestral score. Um, it's very filmic in style, but it's also very, very classical in style. It, it has um, like wonderful elements of kind of Debussy in it, French romantic composers, but it also has some of the melody of, of, of Sibelius. Uh, I watched that film for the first time very, when I was very, very young. It just stuck with me so much. Um, just the melody and then the themes from there and, and of course the visuals and stuff because I was very small. And then I think I remember about eight years ago, I watched it again. It was on the TV here in the UK and, um, and suddenly all the memories of it like just came rushing back. And suddenly I thought, um, oh, wow, I, I, I'm really interested in that. I, I, I could have a go at that and explore film music further. So that's what piqued my interest in it actually. Um, and from there, I just kept exploring um, film scores and, and all the rest of it. But then me personally, uh, so like where I began my professional um, uh, foray into film scoring was I left uh, university, uh, where, where, um, a conservatoire in London, and I, I kind of, I knew I wanted to do composition and I, uh, and I kind of didn't know what to do from there, as I think a lot of people did, you know, when they leave university, they suddenly, they go out into the big, wide world and uh, yeah. you know it's difficult to find your way um I just spoke to as many people as I could I um phoned up friends who could possibly help and eventually a friend of a family friend happened to own a production company and I uh, they did um adverts for corporate content he gave me uh, my very first film to score uh, just to have a go um and see and he really loved it thus began my foray into uh, into media composition. From there, it was just word of mouth, really, um, and and lots of practice. And uh, yeah, it was, it, again, it was quite a, an organic experience. At first, it was very slow. Um, you know, you spend months and months not getting anywhere. Um, How did you stay motivated then? It is difficult to stay motivated. Um, I just always wanted to make music my life. And I think that's what kept me motivated, trying to just see what I could do and 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 meeting people as well every time you meet someone you kind of you get the, this little energy you know boost yeah. and which is brilliant and and kind of one of the wonders of of the music industry um, as a whole and that kind of keeps you going and even if you're not earning any money or you're not getting any credits or um or any work you're still you're still building who you are you're 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 pushing through everything uh and yeah, just listening to lots of music and mm -hmm. try not to lose sight of the, of why you want to do this. Um, and eventually you kind of, yeah, you can kind of push through. Yeah. What's the process like in composing for, I guess, TV or for so many different genres mm. of medium, right? So what's that process like? I, I mean, I don't really know what the process is like for non-media composition where you just compose yeah. for yourself but what's it like because you have to incorporate so many different elements right yeah absolutely there's a lot of elements to juggle well for first and foremost actually you have to make something that the the um your client is happy with yeah um and, and that's so they usually give you like a rough description of what they want like yeah. just walk me through very simple 101 what oh yeah yeah of course uh, yeah so they uh, they'll send you a, a very rough cut of of the film, um, and then and they'll they'll either send you something like a, a little list of you know oh this is kind of what the emotion we want in it, and it'll, it'll it can be very vague. They're like you know this is the part where you know we kind of want the audience to to cry or or, or something like that, and you're like oh okay how do I do that? Um, and at this point we need a joyful theme, and you know it, it can be really anything and. Mm. But the, what's very, very common in media composition is they'll send you a, a temp score, um, so, which is a, uh, a temporary score that they've done. Uh, they've taken someone else's music and popped it on the picture so you can use it as a reference, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing and a curse um, because often by the time the composer reaches the, uh, the production stage uh, and the, the, the temp score has been in there a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the director has become very attached to it. Ah. Um, yeah, so you can see where this is going. And so they, yeah, you have to kind of, you, you want to hit the temp score, but you also, you want to maintain uh, your own sound and your own musical kind of integrity, which is um, 
you get better at, at, at it during, with practice, but it's very hard at first and you kind of you to strike to that balance. Negotiate, yeah. right, and find the balance. Yeah. Exactly. And you also want it to be fulfilling for you because, you know, you have to remember, um, oh, this is my job. I, you know, I love doing it. I love music. Um, mm -hmm. It can't be, uh, you know, you can't just go off on your, on your own tangent. Uh, you, you have to balance all those things, uh, the director's expectations with your own musicality and, uh, yeah, and all the rest of it. So it's, yeah, it's a long process of juggling, but yeah, it can be quite fun. Was yeah. there one thing that you learned having had all your experiences so far that would have helped you in the beginning in terms of how to balance? How to oh, it's such a good balance? question. It really honestly comes with, with so much practice, but I think but really practice. first and foremost is... Sorry, you go first, yeah. So yeah, sorry, it, it very first and foremost, you have to make sure your, the director is happy. Um, at first, I actually, uh, and this would have saved me a lot of grief if I had known this before, is just to, you know, lose your ego uh, for a bit. Um, you know, you can write your own stuff, you know, on the side, but for this, you are working for a fee and you have to, you have to meet their expectations. Um, so if I had known that before, I think I would have been much happier uh, as well. I would have had a lot, a lot fewer phone calls, you know, with clients who were, you know, maybe slightly grumpy that I kind of went off on that on a tangent or something, musical tangent or something like that. But that's fine, you know, we all learn those things. And yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Media composition is, is very fascinating because I, I, I meet a huge number of people who want uh, to do it. I think a lot of people don't realize how much of a, of a business it is actually. Um, it's very much timetabled on a production schedule and, and, and it's, it can be wonderful and creative. Um, but it also can be a slog of, um, you know, making sure to hit certain hit deadlines and hit, um, you know, the right feel for a film and the, the director's expectations. So I think that's really important if, um, you know, people want to move into media composition, it's not just um, your uh, freedom of kind of expression. Uh, and I think I also would have liked to know that you know, before I got into it. And that doesn't mean it's it's a bad job. It's wonderful. I love it. But, you know, you yeah. have to remember that. I was just very intrigued by the word practice, because for you, it's not the same as me practicing, you know, I think no. for you practicing it, it's actually the experience itself, right, of these interactions with clients, yeah. and then you getting the knowledge from that, and then yeah. applying to the next job. Exactly. It is an odd form of practice, but we definitely have to do it. You can't escape practice. Practice is, practice is everywhere. Um, yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, we, uh, you can practice, obviously, talking to clients is, is um, a, a form of practice. Um, even sending how to budget for stuff um, is, you know, takes practice. Uh, but, you know, you can practice the actual composition side of it. You have to practice as well on, and you can do that uh, just by, enjoying uh, composition by, you know, uh, in the evening, if you finished all, all the media work you need to do or something like that, you can just enjoy writing. And that's a form of practice because, you know, you're, you're letting out emotion, you're learning how to express mm -hmm. um, a feeling you've had during the day or something like that. And it, it all, yeah, it all, it all builds up. And, that, and that's kind of, yeah, that's our, that's our form of practice. Yeah. So you're kind of practicing translating emotions into music, which it seems like what a lot of media composition is if you're given a description to say sad music here and then something mm. that's tear jerking so how exactly does that happen maybe it's not explainable in words but i'm just very mm. curious when you're given a certain emotion and how that translates into musical writing i don't think i have an answer for it because it's so specific to who we are i think um as individuals uh Obviously, you, you can hit certain things. We all feel, obviously, the most simple at its most basic level being uh, if, you know, we need a sad a sadness here, um, obviously, you go into sort of minor um, and and you can, and that's a very literal uh, interpretation, of course, but, um, but yeah, you have to just draw on something that maybe makes you feel whatever emotion it is and then translate that into music, but also then then step back a little bit and think, Oh, how, how will how will other people respond to this? Um, obviously, if you're writing your own music for for orchestra or something like that, um, that that's that's fine. You know, you you, you do you. Um, 
but then in media composition you have to have this moment where you think oh okay how this makes me sad but will it make other people sad you just have to draw on empathy uh yeah, I was for, for others word. yeah you have to have yeah, a exactly. lot of empathy to really yeah step into someone's shoes and think how they would hear something but exactly. i guess a lot of it is a bit intuition and just your gut feeling when you yeah. hear something but if you're uh writing i guess you've written music for like a visual setting like a film so do you hear certain music when you see something is that kind of how hmm. uh, do you mean when when i see a a film uh just without music or yeah just, just without music i guess at some point you would have encountered that where you're um, given a visual and then you have to write music that accompanies. oh yeah yes yeah oh uh, yeah all, all the time so um, i guess you hear music when you see visual things is that yeah how? definitely um sometimes That's very fascinating to me because i i don't know like i i look out the window and i don't really you know have a immediate Uh, reaction yeah. to it yeah it's it's the, it is really fascinating um and it, it doesn't happen to everything of course like you know i don't yeah i know see, I, I, um <laughs> yeah that would, no, no, no i know what you mean but i know totally what you mean um you know for instance i find uh just in sort of everyday life uh obviously uh, na nature to me is obviously um incredibly inspiring and i i often can can kind of think of of music uh and i observe that but also you know um more more human you know experiences when you see uh people just kind of in the street uh or you know you got people watching or something like that you uh you wonder you know what their story is and and you, and it's very interesting observing people's faces and, and seeing a lot of humanity there um you know you see maybe what they're going through and, and I, i find that very easy to then turn into a thought process for music um and where where that can come from so it's yeah i just apply all of those thoughts that I have every day in my everyday life to, to when I get a picture, um, mm. to when I get a film uh, to, to write music to. So that's kind of where it comes from. Yeah, I'm just never going to be a composer because I really <laughs> have that type of thinking and uh, yeah, it's just mm. a completely different form of creativity. Yeah. Have, you, have you tried it? Have you tried? Um, I've tried, like when I was maybe 14, 15 in my teenage years, I had like a melody but then it never developed into anything else. So it was just kind of like a melody that I had, but I either didn't have the time or I just could not go beyond just that melody that I came up with. So sure. it doesn't really go anywhere for me. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's definitely very interesting for me to hear composers um, process because it's basically what we're trying to decode as musicians all the time is trying to think what the composer did and what the process was like to, get that music in front of us in the yeah. sheets. Well, it's, it's, it's wonderful when I've written non-media music. It's fascinating to hear, because obviously that comes from a very pure place, uh, kind of um, within, within the composer. It, you know, it's just expression of, of their emotions. Uh, and, and, and it's always fascinating to hear a player um, play it because they get, different, you know, they get different stuff from it. And sometimes you hear exactly what you were thinking while you were writing it, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's just fascinating. It's an endless sort of rabbit hole that you, know, you can keep, keep following. You uh, mentioned that you were an assistant in rehearsals with the Royal Philharmonic BBC Concert Orchestra and Royal Ballet. And so yeah. because this is classical chats, I'm <laughs> curious what you learned about classical music and the world of classical music through your experiences. I feel so, so grateful. To it all it opened my mind to an extent i i, I could never imagine um my favorite experience of all that was was with the royal ballet it was just amazing to see this this marrying of uh amazing classical music to um you know just this world-class kind of dance uh and to it and how how choreographers would interpret the music during rehearsals as well because Uh, the Royal Opera House has its own orchestra um, mm -hmm. and they can, you know, they attend the rehearsals. It's just fascinating to hear the dialogue between the conductor and the, um, and the choreographer and how the choreographer thinks of things in such a different way. Um, and it, it just opened my mind to the astonishing scale of classical music and all the different aspects of classical music. Because before, I think my experience of classical music was quite... Um, It, it, it was broad, but it, but it, it was always uh, kind of soloists or 
orchestras, just seeing kind of uh, all, all of those other art forms that could be, that grew from it, from classical music, from the, this core, uh, that that was kind of just eye-opening and, and totally inspiring. So I, um, you know, uh, I've, I've been writing music for um, a dance piece recently, um, and that's been uh, it's just an amazing experience working with choreographers and stuff. So I, yeah, it, that's what it really gave me, just this eye-opening experience of that there's so much more to classical music than I originally realized. Um, and obviously you've got opera as well in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's just wonderful. Mm. So you mentioned you're working on a dance composition right now. What's it mm. like for your process during this pandemic? Has it changed? Yeah, it's um, so I, I have everything set up in a, in a studio at home anyway, uh, even during, you know, when there isn't a pandemic going on. So so that's nice. I, I can keep working. Um, obviously, we can't have rehearsals for music recordings. We can't do that. Yeah. Um, we, I can record soloists, which is, is OK. Um, but obviously, you can't record ensembles because um, e even you can't record ensembles Individ by individual players because you need everyone in the same room to kind of feed off each other mm -hmm. um which uh yeah i'm sure as you know is obviously really important you know um i can still write i can still produce um just not for large ensemble anymore um it, it's very it's really interesting because i so i actually um I, I say that but i actually earlier in the lockdown in may i think it was i had an orchestral piece of mine recorded and it's uh, that was recorded in so we're in the uk and that was recorded in budapest actually oh. um which is quite strange because they it, it was kind of at the time it was one of the few countries that actually had um was it was allowing people in the same room uh mm -hmm. enough players in the same room uh, so they recorded it obviously distanced and wearing masks and all the rest of it um and we recorded that remotely other than that it's at the moment you know i'm sure we've got another six months of quite tight restrictions going on so it's mm -hmm it really has changed everything. Um, and it's, I think for those uh, outside of, of music who are still uh, able to kind of, um, to watch uh, from a media point of view, I don't think they realize the scale of, of the impact on the industry. And of course, it's sad, it's sad not to be able to meet, um, meet, com uh, meet, uh, meet your players. Working remotely, there's this disconnect, um, which I'm sure obviously you, you feel as well, yeah, I mean, I think I have the luxury of playing the piano where I can kind of be a self-sufficient mm. person to a certain extent. But there's so much yeah. Uh, repertoire, but um, yeah, I do miss that live interaction with other musicians and just playing uh, in public spaces. But I think it's kind of the same idea I had because, you know, I can play at home. I have a piano, luckily. And so for composing, I guess you feed off of the energy of interacting with uh, players and ensembles and that's a very important part that's lacking but I was also thinking you still am able to are able to um, make music on your own and compose but I guess there's yeah. still that inspiration that's lacking in the exactly yeah no it's, it's a really good question to ask because um, obviously this is our new normal for yeah for probably quite a while um, I can still write fine uh, here and and I can still produce, but it's, um, yeah, you, you really miss that um, getting in a room with maybe a quartet or something like that. And you're hearing these people who have trained, you know, on their instruments for decades and or something. And, and they've, you know, they, they have these bits of feedback like, oh, I think it'd be better if I did this or, um, yeah. or, you know, I, th I think it'd be better if maybe I doubled the violas or, or you know, something like that. And it's, yeah, you miss that, uh, obviously. Um, and you may have to do it all, all yourself at home. Yeah, I think I'll end with this last question, which is yeah, yeah, sure. there a composer in particular, I think you mentioned possibly talking about favorite composer, but oh, yeah. is there one that has continuously inspired you in your compositions? Yeah, my uh, favorite composers. Um, oh gosh, I love Chopin's mm. pieces. Um, his piano concertos one and two are like just my, favorite things in the world um and yeah and I, I who else do I love oh I love well I, like I mentioned you know Spirited Away earlier um uh, from a film uh, perspective I love Joe Hisaishi um he did the score for that and multiple uh, Ghibli films afterwards and he uh 
and it's very fascinating. He's actually got a, he, he does amazing concert music as well, which is um, non, uh, not, not for film. Um, and, it's, and it's absolutely wonderful. It's a strange blend of uh, Debussy and, um, and kind of bits of Shostakovich sometimes. And, and it, it, it's just brilliant. And you can hear his film influence as well from that in the kind of the soaring melodies and stuff like that. So I would, yeah, I'd really encourage you to have a look. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he has a wonderful concert called uh, Wish to the Moon, uh, and it's for piano and uh, nine cellos, actually, which is quite strange. Wow. Um, yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, there's some just stunning tracks on there. Who else do I love? Oh, I love, um, oh, I can't be forgot, I, uh, John Powell. Um, he's a, he's very much like um, a film composer, but he also wrote a, he did a foray into classical, uh, classical music. He did a, a war requiem. He's an amazing orchestral composer and a very classical background. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting that his interviews, he's always talking about uh, classical music and stuff like that. Well, thank you so much for coming on Classical. Yeah, Show. thanks so much for having me. Well, I definitely will be listening to the recommendations that he mentioned, and I hope you will too. I will link the stuff in the description for you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for subscribing if you have subscribed it. Why not subscribe if you haven't? Because the more people we have here, the more exciting it is for everyone to come on to Classical Chats and share their stories about classical music and their experience. So, I will see you soon.